citizenship. On a global scale, it is the key factor governing human mobility. Your passport determines where you can travel to, how long you can stay there for, and how easy or difficult it may be to relocate to a destination, should you wish to. As the global population of high net worth individuals continues to rise, these people who value both their mobility and saving time are looking at ways to do both. One of these ways is investment migration programs. By putting a bit of money into a project in a particular country, say a real estate development, uh, these high net worth individuals are able to bypass traditional travel hurdles, such as visa application processes, which can be arduous and Kafkaesque. Today we have with us Philippe Amarante, Managing Director and Head of Henley & Partners, Middle East, to discuss all things CBI. We'll be talking about Middle Eastern demand for CBI programs, why the investments themselves are great opportunities, aside from the citizenship benefits, and some common misconceptions. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Philippe. Thank you very much for the invitation. To start things off, uh, let's talk a bit about passports. Uh, I know that Henley & Partners releases an annual index that uh, judges passports according to the freedom of movement they afford their holder. What are some of the factors that affect a passport's movement up or down the ranking? It's a great question. Um, the Henley and Partners Passport Index is indeed a magnificent tool. Uh, and I think, you know, I can say it with pride, the authority when it comes to compare visa-free waivers around the world. So it features uh, 199 countries, over 227 destinations. And I think it's uh, important to understand because we get asked sometimes, you know, why do we need this? You know, you know, we live in a very complex, globalized world that actually gets more complex day by day. And what might have been good yesterday is maybe not good for tomorrow. So we see quite some dynamics on, in the visa-free waivers uh, that are um, arising. And again, I'm a German national, I have a German citizenship, you know, and you know, one day I can maybe travel to that amount of countries and the next day I can't. Um, and there are some drivers behind that, which uh, I think we believe and needs to be communicated on a regular basis. You know, you see diplomatic uh, fallouts or let's say stress and tension on, on government relationships that can be caused by general elections or by, by other events. Look at the pandemic, right? So, you know, the, 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 the authority this uh, passport index provides is to understand the true strength of a passport, but that's also subject to certain change. And that, again, is a matter of intelligence for you to plan your own you know, mobility and your visa waivers and to understand where actually maybe weaknesses lie. Now, it's interesting that while we're discussing the uh, relative power of someone's passport, a lot of firms in the citizenship by investment space seem to me to be focused more on, uh, for lack of a better term, selling the passport, the citizenship or residence opportunity with the associated investment itself taking a back seat. Um, in your view, are these investment opportunities uh, good opportunities in of and themselves, the passport or citizenship that you gain aside? No, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, maybe some are jumping on the horse from the wrong side, but the truth of the matter is that you know, um, de-risking, uh, you know, uh, and and increasing your optionality is never wrong, whether it's in by investment space or that's related to financial products and services. I think what the pandemic has shown to us is that, um, you know, single nationality, single residence is uh, exposed to to risk that can come. And the, the best way to hedge against that is by uh, creating that portfolio of citizenship and or residence by investments. And uh, it is important, of course, to consider the quality of the investment, but that can actually drive maybe the, the analytical side of the discussion. What is the right program of choice? What is the right jurisdiction? Um, and I think that is, at the end of the day, a key question that anyone has to ask you know, the client first in order to create portfolios that can withstand certain crises that are the hedge that clients are looking for. It's similar to, if I may say, you know, at the end of the day, assets under management. You know, you hold a residence or you hold a passport and you're concerned about the failing of that value. I see. So what you're suggesting here is that 
these opportunities should be looked at in context of a wider portfolio. 100%, absolutely. And you can draw similarities, I think, to 2008, 2009, the financial crisis, you know, with some limitation, of course. But, you know, states are concerned about raising capital and you as a, as a national, as a citizen, you're, you know, concerned about the value that you have uh, as being part of that. So um, it's, a, it's a fascinating discussion. I see. That's quite interesting. So what you're saying is that these investments can be seen as part of a general portfolio as opposed to one-off means of accessing uh, citizenship. No, no, absolutely. And I think it goes both ways. If you're an investor in a country of choice, um, your investment uh, is, you know, making a change in that country. So look at it from countries providing a platform for themselves to raise debt-free capital, which then is basically, you know, attractive for the investor who builds the portfolio to speak. And, and that can be across various jurisdictions, across various regions. And CBI programs, are they exclusively targeted towards ultra high net worth and high net worth individuals? Now, you've told me they aren't exclusively for the super rich, but it does feel as if sometimes they are targeted towards and marketed towards uh, people in that uh, strata of, of income and assets. Now, what in your in your view, is the uh, minimum amount that someone would need to invest to buy into one of these programs? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, look, let's look back. A few years ago, um, those those programs, as you call them, you know, they were very much sought after by the ultra high net worth, uh, also because of the qualifying criteria. But um, as more and more programs come to the table, more and more countries understanding the value and and attracting those investors, um, you know, the more choices you have. And if I can give an example, in Greece, for instance, you purchase a property of two hundred fifty thousand euros. Um, you know, that qualifies for the golden visa in Greece. Yes, you have to add uh, stamp duty, uh, notary costs, and some fees. But we have lots of families who were able to gain that Greece residents uh, for around a budget of 300,000 euros, which I think is a fantastic uh, uh, strategy, very smart. Basically, you you, you gain a uh, capital appreciating real estate asset in the European Union, and you never have to queue anymore to get a visa when you want to travel with your family to Disneyland. Nobody wants to miss out on a trip to Disneyland based on visa problems. Uh, I, I can empathize with that. Now, how has the pandemic impacted demand for uh, these these programs? I mean, our client database has always been more around, you know, the globe and uh, the inquiries and the demand was pretty split. But what is amazing to see at the moment is, and we're going to talk about misconceptions later maybe, um, we see an f- enormous uprise from Anglosphere countries, the US 200%. Uh, UK, not a surprise after Brexit, plus 35%, I think, Canada 50, Australia 40. So there's, um, you know, a huge demand coming from those countries where maybe we can say, you know, um, citizens felt a little bit less treated uh, well when it comes to the management of the pandemic. Even the wealthiest nations in this world have floundered and uh, no government is, you know, is really able to provide that, that overall service to the citizens. And that has created frustration, uh, disappointment maybe to some extent. Um, Think about it. A few months ago, the Australian Prime Minister has made it illegal for Australians to return home in response to the pandemic. And, you know, no one wants, at least I don't want to be just, you know, uh, having a single jurisdiction risk. You know, you want to have options. You want to be mobile. You don't want to be just locked up. That's true. It has been problematic and confusing for citizens of even traditionally, for lack of a better term, a strong passport uh, nations. Now, uh, Philippe, let's look to the region we're in right now. Uh, What Middle Eastern countries have you seen demand rising from the most over the past year? And what are some of the reasons behind this uptick in demand? I think what stands out is um, the demand coming from Saudi Arabia. Um, those clients, uh, most of them are business owners or family offices, are, are saying that the pandemic has served as a, as a catalyst for them uh, to maybe you know, do something they already had for a long time 
uh, in mind but haven't done. And I'll give an example, uh, one of the families said, you know, thanks to remote working, I realize now I can basically work from anywhere. I don't have to sleep next to my factory anymore. So it's about building those or accessing those greater choices and having a presence uh, that, you know, you can basically do from anywhere at any time. So call it maybe creating a greater omnipresence. Um, and those programs are nothing else than, you know, doing the necessary and combining it with the useful. Now, Philippe, there are a lot of CBI sellers out there, it feels like. Um, what does a prospective investor need to look out for when uh, choosing to go with one of these programs? And what would you say are some of Henley & Partners' USPs in this space? Well, I think uh, you hit the nail on the top when you said seller. Um, and I will ask the question, how can you provide excellent, sustainable service to clients uh, when you get your priorities wrong from the get-go? Um, we're not a sales agent. Uh, we are a professional service firm and we pride ourselves in providing honest, legally competent uh, and, and honest advice to our clients. Uh, and we do this now since more than 25 years. And I think the, uh, the reputation that we have gained stands for the value and the excellence that we have provided to our, to our clients, uh, both institutional as well as private. But um, I will say one thing, um, you know, uh, the internet sometimes can be a dark place. You know, if you, if you feel sick, you know, would you go rather to the doctor or Google your symptoms, you know? So I think there's a lot of uh, misleading, outdated information available um, that sometimes uh, clients actually get a little bit too much baited in, a bit much too much, uh, you know, uh, hooked up on. And then, you know, we have to repair the damage, if I can be uh, dramatically. Um, you know, I, I, I always tell my clients, you know, going up, climbing up uh, the top of Mount Everest is maybe not the hardest part. Uh, coming down safely when the weather changes, that's where, you know, your expertise and your, your experience kicks in. And that's what we basically do at Henley. We are a global platform. We have 30 offices worldwide. Um, you know, we are compliant on, on par with international standards. Uh, our data protection, data integrity is second to none. And I think that's at the end of the day what our clients appreciate. Again, both governments as well as private clients. And I encourage uh, everyone uh, to always double check twice uh, and not to always believe everything they see just because it's in the internet. You know, I, I've done this mistake myself by being sick and not Googling the same thing, and I got a shoulder surgery afterwards, so here we are. So what you're saying is, even in your world, there is a lot of fake news out there. There's, um, it's, it's a matter of regulation, right? It's a matter of uh, misconduct, unfortunately. Um, our industry is still very young and requires uh, regulation, requires better governance. Um, requires more honest uh, service and advice to clients. Uh, and that's something that we see a little bit with concern. Um, and I, again, I invite everyone who is in this industry, which is exciting because we change lives. We help countries to, to elevate their economies. Uh, you could argue at some point those investments are creating jobs, right? Um, but I think it has to be done in the right way and not in the wrong way. Now, that nicely brings us to my final question for you of the day. Uh, Philippe, what are the three biggest misconceptions around the citizenship or uh, residency by investment space today? That's an interesting question. Uh, let me think about it. Um, I think number one, maybe that only the wealthy are doing it. That's not correct. That's a myth. Um, yes, indeed, ultra high net worth uh, have complex situations and those require complex solutions to it. Um, but it's a much wider space of, you know, uh, affluent or private clients. And if you think about the example I gave you with Greece, very much affordable uh, to, you know, and you can create a high impact solutions without being a billionaire. Right? I think the second misconception maybe is that it's only people doing it with weak passports. That's not, that's not correct. We have we have clients, you know, from the U.S., from Germany, Switzerland, and, uh, you know, sometimes their motive to do it is, you know, to be able to travel, let's say, uh, safer in high-risk jurisdictions. If you check in at a hotel and you hold your, you know, famous red Swiss passport, you might become a target, right? So it's not only people with weak passports doing these things. It's also um, clients from, you know, developed countries uh, of which you maybe wouldn't think they would do it in the first place. I think the third misconception is uh, related to the transparency and to the governance around those programs and what actually, what impact they have in, in the jurisdictions in the country of choice. 
Um, you know, so I would argue that we have done maybe not the greatest job yet uh, as an industry to uh, advocate and to highlight how those programs can help to create jobs, stimulate local economies, and, and have basically a positive social impact. And, you know, I, I would go actually so far and say that is an invitation to maybe increase governance, increase transparency, to make sure that everybody understands the value of it and it's not seen as something that shouldn't be done in first place. It's not about having more investors. I think it's having better investors for the better social impact in those countries. It's, it's interesting that you point to the social impact as well as the, the benefit to, uh, to the economies of, of the countries that are uh, granting these citizenships and residency uh, rights. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you Thank so you. much for joining us, Philippe. And I look forward to catching up next time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.